Salutations everybody, it is Maddie here today and we all know that that wait for Elder Scrolls 6 is going to be years and years and years. So I'm here to list a bunch of games for you guys to play while you're waiting for Elder Scrolls 6. These might be games you've heard of, they might not be. I'm trying to recommend a wide variety of games. I did this for Fallout 4 before that came out. I actually did two videos for that and so I was thinking of doing the same thing for Elder Scrolls 6 since the wait will be so long. I also get the feeling that this is going to be a video loaded with comments asking Maddie, what about game X? How could you forget that one? Look, I'm just going off my personal taste. Games that I thought of that, oh, this will give them a substantial amount of playtime and be worth their while. Ease the wait for Elder Scrolls 6. So let's start off with number one, which is Dragon Age Origins. This is my personal favorite in the entire Dragon Age series. Origins is the Bioware I love. A beautiful, aching soundtrack that just pulls you in instantly from the title screen. I mean, you can hear it in the background right now. This is some heavy stuff, and the second you fire up the game, it's one of those, okay, I know I'm in for a really good adventure. It has some of the best written characters in video games, Morgan being one of them. These are some fantastic companions to travel around with in Dragon Age. Combat resembles something along the lines of Knights of the Old Republic. That is a hit or miss for a lot of gamers out there. You might not be a fan of the tactical gameplay and that's entirely understandable, but it's one that can really break the barrier for a lot of gamers who may not be a fan of them. I think it's worth a shot because the story itself has so many twists and turns and also a heavy emphasis on choices where to see everything you need at least two playthroughs but don't worry the ending is satisfying for both ways you play the game mind you that's just if you want to go the bare minimum there are tons of ways to play the game also the ultimate edition has some fantastic emotional dlc and you can get this game for very cheap considering the fact that this is a very old title i'd imagine a lot of you have played it at this point in time but if you have not do yourself the favor and play Dragon Age Origins. It is roughly a 20 or so hour adventure, but you can get multiple playthroughs out of this, like I said, at the very minimum too, as you build the army against the Darkspawn. Up next is Persona. Now I'm talking about the series in general. We're gonna do this for a couple of games on this list because it's going to be such a long wait that I don't wanna narrow it down to just one title in a series often. I wanna make sure that I'm suggesting to you guys very broad categories so you have a lot to explore with this list. For me, I personally recommend Persona 3 and 4 four as those are the ones that really made this series incredibly popular but two is not a bad choice either i'm not sure if you guys like one that much but anyway persona 3 and 4 really do have that same thing like dragon age origins where right away you're going to be pulled in by that soundtrack as you go through your day-to-day -day life as a high school student trying to solve the mystery of what's going on in either of the game both mysteries are incredibly lengthy and engaging experiences that go on about 70 80 100 hours if you want it to be because it depends on how much you invest in a lot of the side activities. You can do things like increase your social link by hanging out with people around your town. And when you do so, that'll connect to the combat in the game, which is fantastic. And once again, also more strategic focus, but it's so worthwhile spending time with these characters because not only does it benefit the gameplay, it also benefits you from the point of getting to know these very interesting and compelling characters. Characters who may look like idiots up front may actually have a very deep backstory and one that makes you feel for them personally. Characters like Chie, Yukiko, Junpei and so on. I love all these characters from all these different Persona games. What makes great games is when everything ties together between the gameplay, the story, the music and so on. And that's what Persona does where you have this great story fueled by its characters which you can spend time with to up your social links which lets you get to know these characters better, progresses the story as well as ties into this gameplay system which is also really interesting highlighting weaknesses on your enemy choosing your own persona squad, crafting your own persona, and so on. It's really a worthwhile experience on top of the soundtrack that I listen to more than any single video game out there. Seriously, Persona 4's soundtrack is a work of art and it makes that game Persona 4 dancing all night all the more worth it to play if you're like me. But it's not just boiling down to the characters. There's plenty of side activities you can partake in school sports, fishing, this type of stuff is what I love about games is when you get those obscure side activities that take you away from things. But mind you, you're living your day-to-day -day life. So when you spend time doing something, it's taking away from another thing. So there is this high replay value, but then you can reload your clear data, do a new game plus. So this is another series that gives you that big bang for your buck. 
At number three, we have Stardew Valley. I love this game so much, man. I can't believe this is a game that isn't talked about enough. I think a lot of people forgot about it in 2016, but now it's available on so many systems on the Xbox One, the PS4. It's been available on the PC for a long while. You inherit your grandfather's farm. From there, it's really up to you. That's the awesome part that you could just introduce yourself to people in the town, start running quests. You could go mining in caves. You can go monster hunting, or maybe you just want to stick around at home, chop down some trees trees, plant things, and focus on the farming aspect. Go fishing. And mind you, this is similar to Persona in the way where you have to go through your day-to-day -day life, managing your time, managing your energy, because sometimes you get so caught up in an activity, you'll blow through all your energy. It'll be 12 in the afternoon. You'll think, holy crap, I just need to go to bed now so that I can have energy to do things the next day. So it's all about moderation as well, and almost like a life sim in a strange way. Stardew Valley doesn't have much of a story, but the beginning really does pull you in, gives purpose to the game, which I think is important so that the freedom opens up from there as you build from the ground up on your grandfather's farm. I'll leave the rest for all of you to discover. Moving on to The Witcher series, primarily The Witcher 2 and 3. While I don't think The Witcher 1 has aged well at all, The Witcher 2 is a game that doesn't get enough credit because of how damn good The Witcher 3 is. I mean, I remember playing The Witcher 2 and it's such a fantastic title, man. I mean, this is where the big Witcher 3 was born. You see the gradual progression with each game from CD Projekt Red. So I don't know if you guys are like me where you enjoy going back and playing old their titles to see how they aged and where certain ideas originated from. But The Witcher 2 is full of that with a compelling story, not as long as The Witcher 3, where The Witcher 2, you can finish in about 30 to 40 hours, but it is so beyond worthwhile, man. The Witcher 2 has a brutal, gory, engrossing story that I just can't get enough of. Surprisingly fast-paced gameplay, where in The Witcher 3, it's more about the patience, but in The Witcher 2, you're really hacking and slashing, rolling around. It's a much quicker paced type of combat. Now, I do feel that The Witcher 2 sometimes is a little more difficult to navigate and solve quests in comparison to The Witcher 3, not because The Witcher 3 just throws a waypoint on your map most of the times and says, hey, go here to this radius, find this item or whatever, but no, The Witcher 2 sometimes can be a little complicated complex. It can almost be a little overwhelming for some gamers out there, but still, it's one that I really do recommend you give a shot at because you can see where a lot of the great ideas and the infamous Witcher 3 originated, which is the obvious other title that I can't help but recommend if you're waiting for the Elder Scrolls 6. This is the game that likely the Elder Scrolls 6 is going to be compared to. The Witcher 3 is widely described, and I could agree, as one of the best RPGs of all time, where the story combines family emotion that isn't forced upon you, but rather natural, along with the hardships of being Geralt the Witcher, and how this man just never seems to really catch a break. You really feel for the characters in The Witcher 3 with its unique sense of storytelling. Gameplay has evolved from The Witcher 2, where things are a little more slowed down, but it's much more strategic in the way where you're gonna be circling enemies. There's a bigger emphasis on boss fights and being more tactical within those, such as highlighting different weaknesses and powers, times to strike, and so on. I don't think I need to say more on The Witcher 3, as it's quite obvious it's one of the best games ever made, and I think you'd be doing yourself a disservice to not play it. Hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of hours wait for you in just the vanilla game, and the DLC is even better. I know a lot of people really like the Heart of Stones DLC, but Blood and Wine is something that's arguably in more enjoyable than the vanilla game I've heard. Just some rumors down the grapevine. Maybe you should try out The Witcher 3. Anyway, the next series I want to talk about is Divinity Original Sin. This is another fantasy RPG world. Now this one's for the old school Fallout fans out there because this is an isometric RPG. Divinity Original Sin's greatest strength is its writing. It constantly has you either laughing, intrigued, wanting to learn more, and so on. Every book I could read, every conversation I could have, I made sure I did because the writing for this game grips you does not let go whatsoever. Quests lie about everywhere and are naturally discovered. Not everyone's marked with an exclamation point on the map or above their head saying, hey, quest here, talk to people, learn more. Quests evolve, sometimes you'll have to come back to older areas with new tools, much like in the vein of Metroidvania style titles where you'll be able to explore new areas with those tools. It also has one of the more unique co-op campaign experiences I've had where First of all, you don't think much of co-op and isometric together, but this works surprisingly well, where for example, me and my teammate will make a choice and then we'll have to play rock, paper, scissors to decide which of our differing choices will be the one that progresses the story. And when we 
disagree, we'll have conversations outside of that conversation for the quest where we might argue, where we might thrash each other, and that will fuel our character's personality, which will then in return unlock certain skills and attributes for the character to build them out how you want to. This game is highly replayable, especially in terms of role playing, where you are who you want to be. You can say some crazy stuff, you can be the good guy, the bad guy, the funny guy, and so on. And it does help that this game has a sequel that's currently in early access, but it's looking better than the first one, which is really hard to top because the first one is fantastic, averaging at about 80 hours long in my first run, and just you can keep running through this game over and over and over. It's a title where you see your quest log, you get overwhelmed and as you check each one off more and more, you get that sense of satisfaction that you cannot get enough of. The Divinity Original Sin feeds the beast and it's a game that if you like isometric RPGs, you owe yourself to play it. You know I couldn't go too long without talking about another JRPG, I'll make it quick for you guys. Kingdom Hearts is one of the most convoluted story series I've ever played, but if you pay attention, it's also one of the most interesting ones. Kingdom Hearts features the main protagonist of Sora, and you are joined by Donald and Goofy, but then there's a bunch of spin-offs where, for example, in Birth by Sleep, you'll play as Terra, Aqua, and Ventus, Dream Drop Distance, you'll switch between Rico and Sora, same thing goes for Rechain of Memories, then there's 358 over two days where you play as Roxas. There are so many different Kingdom Hearts games out there, I know it's very very hard to keep track of so don't get me wrong there and we have 2.8 coming out we also have 1.5 2.5 coming out on the ps4 then you got kingdom hearts 3 i know it's a lot to keep track of but if you just keep it simple for yourself by 1.5 2.5 and 2.8 play them all in order you'll be good to go because this story is so fun to follow because of how complex it gets and i know that sounds like a cop-out but i think that just seems to be the general consensus of the entire kingdom hearts community it has a fantastic action battle system something akin to final fantasy 15 which i know a lot of gamers compared kingdom hearts and final fantasy 15. i think kingdom hearts is a lot more fast-paced it's a lot more enjoyable too and it's also very much more skill focused where there's a lot more action blocking instead of final fantasy 15's quick time event focus for blocking this boils down to skill. Tying in Disney and Final Fantasy sounds like the dumbest idea on paper. I have no idea how it went through. Square Enix must have been in the shitter, but holy crap, did it work out really well. Where you'll visit some of your favorite worlds from Disney and solve problems for these characters you learned to love growing up from the movies. But also getting that enjoyable RPG experience, not in the sense of choice, but in the sense of being Sora and seeing how his story develops as it is one of the most emotional games I've played. One of the few games Kingdom Hearts 2 to bring Maddie to tears. I've been saying that a lot lately, but only Kingdom Hearts 2 and Final Fantasy 15 have done that. Two games from Square Enix, so hey, go figure. And if you really think that Kingdom Hearts can't pull on your heartstrings, can't make you feel things, I dare you to give it a shot. I guarantee you it will. Next up is Darkest Dungeon. This is a title that I think isn't talked about enough either. It's a gothic side-scrolling strategy game where characters hesitantly crawl through corridors trying to remain calm as they are under attack by bandits and monsters alike, but you, the gamer, are compelled to get that loot to help rebuild your estate. In Darkest Dungeon, you are constantly getting new members for your team. It's something along the lines of XCOM. You can rename them. They all have their own pros, they have their own quirks which make them defective at times in combat where certain things will stress them out more than others, and also certain things will relieve them of that stress more than others. And that is the key to Darkest Dungeon is stress management. It's a very unique mechanic where each hit will add stress as they crawl through catacombs and caves, and there will be a breaking point for them where they become traumatized and just start freaking out and eventually betray the team, become incredibly selfish, and steal loot and so on, or will they rise to action in this moment of need and be a step ahead of everyone else on the team? Although Darkest Dungeon has you exploring a lot of the same dungeons over and over again, it's always a very interesting experience because you don't know who's gonna break under the stress, who's gonna rise under the stress. Is your team just gonna flat out die? Because there's permadeath. So when you're investing, you're removing quirks from your favorite hero. You're upgrading his weapons, his armor. When he's gone, he's gone. And I think that is a risk that a lot of gamers really enjoy taking because it adds this intensity to each battle. Also, this is a title that had a very unique art style that had my eyes glued to the screen constantly because there's not much out there like it. 
Next up is Dragon's Dogma, and I know some of you out there like Monster Hunter, but some of you are like me and really don't, and Dragon's Dogma is the game for you if you're really not a big Monster Hunter fan, because Dragon's Dogma has dozens upon dozens of hours of content, whether it's side questing, which you'll mainly be doing because the main story in this game is awful, but still, this is a title where you're going to find yourself climbing up a titan, attacking his weak points, his appendages, and watching him crumble down as your squad that you assemble wreaks havoc on him when he's weak and down. Although the game tends to get in its own way at times, for example, when traveling the world, there isn't fast travel, so you're going to go from one end of the map to the other and back again to get things done sometimes, and that can be incredibly frustrating for gamers, but if you're willing to look past that or just overall deal with it, you're going to be in for a good treat, because this is some of the more unique gameplay in the RPG scene as you create your character and your side companion, but also you get different side companions from the cloud that other people have created. When you're taking care of their side companions, they'll receive rewards for you using them, so it compels you to build the best side companion you can to send him back into the world for other players to use. Mind you, this game is a little bit older now, so you might not be getting as many rewards for using your side companion out there, but still, it's one of the more unique gameplay blends I've seen. Almost every battle feels like a boss fight where it's this blend of Shadow of the Colossus and Monster Hunter, which are two fantastic titles and seeing them mixed together in this great way is always a satisfying gameplay experience. So if you're just looking for something fun to play as the hours go by, then Dragon's Dogma is the title for you. And moving on to the last set of titles, we're going to be specifically talking about a game developer here, and that is Super Giant Games. They have created Bastion and Transistor. Bastion is a sort of post-apocalyptic beat-em-up brawler game where you get different types of equipment. You can upgrade the Bastion itself. It's very different and like Transistor, it's almost always on sale where you can get it for dirt cheap. Now, mind you, this isn't a game that's going to grind the hours away. It's a very short title. It is replayable. The same can be said for Transistor. Both these games sit about at the six to eight hour range, but they are some of the best game experiences I had for each of the years they came out. Transistor is still a title that sits with me at one of my games of the year for 2014. This is a title that threads every single element of the game together. The music makes so much more sense after you beat the game, you listen to the lyrics and you hear that's what they were talking about. The gameplay is so much different than anything else out there as you plan out your attack and then you press X and you just see how things go, see how the cards fall, and then you go from there. Having a muted protagonist, although it's not one you create, is a unique experience in its own right, but it also makes sense. But not just because, oh, my character's silent because they want me to experience it. They do it in a way that makes sense and drives the story forward. There is side content in this game, such as trials that you can do, but the main focus here is that story and that gameplay, the music, everything is tied together. So it's all right there at the forefront. And these are two titles I cannot recommend enough as along with the rest of this list, because that will conclude this very long video. I hope you guys did find this enjoyable and worthwhile and that you find at least one title amongst the bunch I mentioned that will be worth playing while you wait for Elder Scrolls 6. Are there any games that I missed that maybe you want to recommend to other gamers out there before they play Elder Scrolls 6? Then let us all know in the comments down below. I'd love to hear what you guys have to suggest. Be sure to follow me on Twitter, like me on Facebook. The links are as always in the description down below. Check out TriggerBomb.com, the place by Bethesda fans for Bethesda fans. Other than that, stay sexy, stay active. I love you all. Peace.